It is my great honor, fortune, and pleasure to be with all of you this evening. It is the first time in my life I have been in the state of Utah. And I was brought here just like a little tiny piece of iron by the magnetic affection of Charu Prabhu. <clears throat> As Charu was speaking, I recollected something. He was speaking about uh, this book that I wrote, The Journey Home. Actually, the seed of the writing of that book came about during an encounter I had with Charu. I think it was around 1979. He had a radio station. <clears throat> and he invited me to be his guest. And he asked, me to describe my trip to India when I was a teenager. And I seldom ever told anyone that story for a couple reasons. One is I really didn't like to talk about myself. Two is I thought if I tell the story, no one will believe me. <laughs> but somehow or other, <clears throat> I was on the radio, so I was on the spot, and I didn't want to start making excuses. And I just started saying something, and he's so expert. When somebody really cares, they're empowered by abilities beyond their own. So he kind of drew these stories out of me. And I was, I spoke, I guess, about an hour. And I was thinking, I really hope nobody who knows me ever hears this. <laughs> because I was told this is only for the public in a certain little area, and nobody that I know will ever hear it. And within a couple of weeks, everybody I knew was asking me for more stories. <laughs> and then they started saying, you should write a book about it. And I said, no, no, that's it. I'll never write a book about it. And I guess it was in the early 2000s, one of my very dearest friends, his name Bhakti Tirta Swami. He was on his deathbed. Bhakti Tirta Swami was African American. He was born around 1950 in the ghettos of Cleveland. And in the 50s and early 60s, if you're born of a minority, in the ghettos, then it's almost for sure you'll live and die in the ghettos. There was very little opportunity. I remember he was telling me in grade school, every male carried a loaded gun. It was a rough place. But his mother was a very religious Christian. And she taught him how to see grace and hope in every opportunity of life, even though they were in poverty. And he took that to heart. And just by his influence of giving a 
affection and, and inspiration to others as a child. He got a full scholarship to Princeton University and he became the leader of the civil rights movement there. And later on, after he graduated, he was working for government agencies and everything with his degree. He was looking for spiritual connection. He was thinking, whatever I have, if it doesn't change the world in a positive spiritual way, what is the use? And he went on a journey, and ultimately he found the path of bhakti, and he found his guru, Srila Prabhupada, who happens to be Charu's guru and my guru. So when we met the first time, I think it was 1972 or three, we just had such a connection. We spoke for hours and hours and hours, and we kept that communication going for decades. And one day I received a phone call from him. He said, the doctors tell me I only have three days to live. I really would like to see you before I die. He was in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> I was lecturing at a certain place and I told the people that I have to go, I can't give my lecture because my friend is calling for me. And they said, well, why don't you give your lecture at an earlier slot and then you can go. So I gave the lecture and I told everybody why I was going. And then I got in a car with someone and we started driving, about a six hour drive. And I happened to look in the rear view mirror and almost everybody at the lecture was driving behind me <laughs> because they wanted to see him. So when I arrived, something incredible happened. I was watching a room full of people. And I knew some of them. People who were, their faith had been shattered by different experiences in life. People who were abused in their childhood. People who were um, antagonistic for <coughs> justified reasons. And as he was just sitting there, one of his legs was amputated. He was totally emaciated. There were giant tumors in, all over his body that you could see. And he was just smiling and speaking and everyone in the room was crying. And as they came out of the room, I came out with them. People were literally falling on their knees saying, I've never had such a spiritual experience is hearing from him. So I went back in the room and it was just the two of us. And I said, how did you do that? I've known you for 35 years. I've never seen you do that to people. I've never seen anybody in my life do that to people. And his smile got even bigger. <laughs> and he said, you see, this is the answer to my prayer. I've always prayed that I could help people. I've always prayed that I could bring people closer to loving God. And now that I'm dying, and I'm in this physical condition, people listen to me more than they've ever listened to me before. I can affect people's hearts more in one day than what it would probably take me 20 years to do if I was in good health. So this disease is a blessing. And then he smiled even bigger. And I was speechless. The next day, because I had a really big day schedule, I had lectures in colleges and other places, and I went to say goodbye to him. 
he was laying in his bed. And I said, um, before I said anything, I was about to say goodbye. And he, he grabbed my hand. I was sitting on a chair, he was laying in bed. And he said, I have one request. I was a little taken off guard because he never requested anything from anybody. He said, I want to die in your arms. Please stay with me. I said, as long as you're living, I'm going to be at your bedside. Of course, it wasn't so difficult to say because he only had two more days to live. But by God's grace, he lasted eight weeks more. <laughs> and I couldn't break my promise. <clears throat> what he gave me in those eight weeks was something I'll never forget. I've read so many books and scriptures and teachings about love of God and how when there's love of God, there's such love between other beings. But I never could conceive that I would experience such love between two people. Because time was of the essence. We knew he could die at any moment, at any day. So we didn't talk about elections. We didn't talk about the political climate of America or India or anywhere else. We didn't discuss so much gossip or worldly things because it really doesn't matter when you're about to die. What really matters is what is our connection beyond this life to God? We just shared stories for hours a day, poured our hearts out with real spiritual concern for others. And I remember one day, the pains in his body were at such a peak. They would kind of get more and less as each day. But this day, the pain went, it seemed, to the core of his bones. His entire body was trembling. He was sitting on a chair. And as we were talking, I could see he couldn't focus on what I was saying. So I just began to chant this Maha Mantra that Jai Krishna was chanting. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. There are many mantras in the Vedas. This Maha Mantra is a special medicinal mantra for awakening the love of God that's within our hearts. Sri Chaitanya, who propounded this Maha Mantra in a special way 500 years ago, he prayed, Nam Nam Akari Bahuda Nija Sarva Shaktis. He said, my dear Lord, you have many names. These names have been revealed through different scriptures, through different saints throughout history, throughout the world. And in each of these names, you have invested your presence, your love, your compassion, your sweetness, your beauty, and the power of all of these. Because these names are so pure that when we chant them, they purify our hearts. And like water upon the seed of love that's within all of our hearts, they nourish and awaken that love. 
which manifests in our lives in this world as compassion for all beings. So I was chanting, and he started chanting with me, just speaking it, not singing it. And then he held my hand, and something happened that was inconceivable. Suddenly, he smiled. His mouth was like an ocean. I'd never seen a smile like this. It practically reached his ears. And he has a dark complexion and very white teeth, so it was really extraordinary. And tears were pouring from his eyes, tears of joy. It was actually tears of ecstasy as far as I could see. And he squeezed my hand and he said, it doesn't get any better than this. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and he squeezed me harder and said, it doesn't get any better than this. He said, in the condition I am today, I'm tasting the sweetness of God's love. And there's nothing that could compare to it. He said, this love that I'm experiencing in my heart as I'm chanting can never be taken away from us. Not even by death. He said, I know where I am, I know where I'm going, and I'm ready, and I'm happy. He said, I've never felt such happiness. While he was speaking, his body was still trembling the same way as it was before. There was no difference in the pain. The Bhagavad Gita teaches true intelligence, Krishna tells this in the Gita, is when we find our happiness within, when we are illuminated and enlightened from within. If we cannot find happiness within ourselves, we cannot find any lasting, substantial happiness anywhere else. Spirituality is about discovering the love of God that's within our hearts and being an instrument of that love in everything we do, in whatever we speak. And in living such a compassionate spirit of service, we find the happiness of the heart. Things could give some sense of satisfaction to the mind and to the physical senses. But things can never give fulfillment to the heart. Only love. To love and to be loved can give satisfaction to the heart. And the origin of that love, according to all these great saints and teachers, is the love between the eternal soul and the supreme soul, who has many names. We call Krishna, Radha, the source of all love. When we make that connection, the original, natural love of the soul awakens. Time is an inconceivable power. You cannot see it, cannot touch it, cannot taste it, cannot feel it, but yet time is so powerful. It's in the process of destroying every planet of the universe, extinguishing the sun, evaporating every ocean. What to speak of at every moment? Our little bodies are getting older. 
time is so powerful. The greatest scientific brains cannot stop it. Beauty cannot entice it or seduce it. Bribes cannot corrupt it. All the militaries on earth with all their arsenals cannot stop its progress. How we choose to utilize our time is the most precious wealth that we have because we have free will. The soul is beyond time. The living force seeing through our eyes and hearing through our ears and tasting through our tongues. The true self that's witnessing our life with all its changes from infancy to childhood to adolescence to middle age. To some of us, we're getting pretty old. It's a part of God, an instrument of God's love. He was experiencing that love. He was weeping in ecstasy while he was about to die. I was asked to speak tonight about happiness. And I really didn't know what I was supposed to talk about because I'm not so good at preparing. But I saw some real happiness in Bhakti Tirtha Swami. A couple days later, he said to me, you should write a book about your travels when you were young. I think he heard the tape that Charu made. <laughs> and I said, I will not write such a book. I said, talking about me, I, me, mine, every page, that's arrogance. I don't want to do that. Maybe I'm too arrogant to do it. And besides that, I only went to one semester of a junior college and I didn't get good grades. I don't even know how to write. <laughs> you know, I hitchhiked to India when I was a teenager and I got my my advanced degree in the caves of the Himalayas. <laughs> he looked at me, he was laying in bed. He said, it is not your story. Nothing is ours. He was preaching pretty strong to me. <laughs> he said, we are entrusted with whatever we have, whether if it's our wealth, our intelligence, our influence over others, our abilities, or our stories. It's been entrusted to us for a higher purpose, to be used in compassion. If your story will inspire people with hope and a spiritual direction in their life, then it would be an act of gross arrogance for you not to write it. Why are you so selfish? <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> he said, promise me on my deathbed that you will write this book and you will publish it. I didn't say anything. He said, you cannot refuse the last wish of a man on his deathbed. <laughs> Promise me. What would you do? <laughs> I promised him. <laughs> and then he squeezed my heart, my hand tighter. And he smiled, so big smile, and said, you cannot 
tell a lie to a man on his deathbed. <laughs> so, I didn't say anything. But I was convinced that in the next few days I was going to convince him to withdraw my promise. But in a very timely way, he left before I could do that. So in his honor, from the seed of Charu Prabhu's inspiration for me to speak, what I never spoke, um, I wrote the book. As I was driving here, just a couple hours ago, I was wondering what topic I should specifically speak on in re relationship to happiness. And just when I was thinking like that, I saw a sign on the highway. It said, Salt Lake. Have any of you seen that sign? <laughs> and I was thinking, that's it. That's what I'm going to speak on. Salt. Does that sound like an interesting subject? <laughs> well, I'm going to try to make it interesting. <laughs> what we could learn from salt. Such a common thing. We taste it, we see it but it could change our life. I'm going to give a little story from South India. This coming year, 2017, throughout South India, there's going to be major celebrations because it's the birthday of one of the greatest spiritual figures in the history of India. His name is Ramanuja. 2017 marks the 1,000th birthday of Ramanuja. He has tens and tens and millions of followers even today. The most beautiful and glorious temples and educational institutions in the southern part of India are mainly inspired by himself with his followers to this day. He lived in a place called Sri Rangam. And when I was there a couple years ago, I read a beautiful story. <clears throat> his successor was named Parasara. When Parasara was a little boy of five years old, he was brought up by his father and mother, <laughs> and he had a twin brother too. And at the time, there was the debate champion of India coming to that town. Now, at that time, which is over 900 years ago, Debate was the national sport of India. If you take baseball and football and basketball and hockey and, and, hockey and, um, and, and cricket, <laughs> put them all together, they don't equal the popularity of debate in those days. So here was the undefeated debate champion of all the lands, and he was such an arrogant person. Wherever he went, he was carried on a beautiful decorated canopy, and there was a whole procession of marching bands and Brahmins chanting mantras and people calling out, here comes the debate champion. He can answer any 
question and defeat any challenge. And any scholar would usually run and hide when he would come because they knew that not only would he defeat people, but he would totally humiliate them in the process. So all the scholars are hiding and he's coming to conquer everybody in the village. And little Parasara, five years old, he runs up and he's very small under the palaquin. And he looks up and says, in a little child's voice, I have a question for you. And the debate champion looks down at him. He said, who are you to ask me a question? The milk from your mother's body is still on your lips. Get out from here. And the little boy said, if you're such a learned person, why are you so much hung up with my body? Answer my question. And the man said, I have defeated every scholar in the world. Who are you to ask a question? And the little boy reached down and scooped up sand and held it up and said, answer this question. How many grains of sand are in my hand? He was not expecting a question like that. He was speechless. <laughs> he didn't know what to say. And meanwhile, a whole crowd of people came around and they were all looking at him. His reputation was on the line and he was speechless. Suddenly, all of his ability to speak just went away. Because that boy had no ego, because he had such a pure heart, it affected him. And then the little boy said, my dear sir, a person with good qualities is like a tree with many fruits. Because of the heaviness of the fruit, the tree is very happy to bow down to others. But a person who has no good qualities thinks himself better than everyone. He said, if all of your knowledge does not create humility, respect for others, and love for God, then it is as, it is as worthless as this handful of sand. And then he took the sand and <laughs> he threw it. The man came off his palaquin and bowed before the child and said, I accept you as my teacher, my guru. My whole life has been in the wrong direction. Many years later, Parasara had another student. And he asked him, what is the qualities of a person who truly knows themselves. What are the qualities of an enlightened being? And Parasara was such a humble man. He said, it, it takes somebody on that platform to really answer your question. He's, now, he's, this is the guru speaking. He said, I'm not on that platform, but I know somebody who is. His name is Ananta. He lives on a mountain called Tirumala in Tirupati. Now this is 950 years ago. So this disciple was told to go there. He had to walk 400 miles by foot through incredibly dangerous, lonely jungles with tigers and panthers and snakes and mosquitoes.
mosquitoes. He had to cross rivers. Finally, after he reached, he had to climb seven mountains, and he reached the top, and there he met Ananta. And Ananta gave him a little um, shack to live in, a little hut. And he said, my guru, Parasara, sent me all the way here to ask you a question. Ananta said, what is your question? He said, what are the qualities I have to develop to know who I am? Ananta said, let me think about it and answer you later. Six months passed. He didn't say another word about it. He's just waiting for the answer. <laughs> he was attending so many classes. He was doing seva or doing services. He was doing so many things during that six months, waiting for the answer. And at a certain time, there was a big festival that Ananta was having, because this place was really the wilderness at that time. Today, it's Tirupati. Millions of people come there every year. But at that time, it was a lonely jungle. And Ananta said, help to feed all the people that are coming. So this student, he fed thousands of people. First, the first batch. And after he served everyone in the first batch, he sat down to eat and Ananta said, please serve the next batch. So he put his plate aside and served the second batch. He sat down to eat third, fourth, fifth. Finally, it was late at night. The entire festival field was completely empty and he sat down to eat and eaten all day. And when he was about to take his first bite, Ananta came. Do you like the story so far? Ananta said, if I remember, you have a question for me. That was about six months ago. He said, yes, yes. He jumped up. He said, what are the qualities of a person who's truly enlightened? This gets back to this street sign on the highway here in Utah. He said, a truly saintly person, an enlightened man or woman, is like salt. Is like a chicken. Is like a crane. And is like you. I have nothing else to say. And he walked away. <laughs> the man was really confused. He was humble, respectful and confused. So he walked down seven mountains, crossed over all the rivers and all the jungles, and weeks later he came back to Sri Rangam, and when he arrived, Parasara happened to be there. He said, oh, did you go? Did you get the answer to your question? And he looked at him, he said, I got an answer. And Parasar said, oh, tell me, what was the answer? I, I, I really need to know it. What is the answer? He said, that an enlightened person is like salt, like a chicken, <laughs> like a crane, like me. And Parasar clapped his hand. He said, perfect, comprehensive. Everything in the scriptures is included in that answer. The man, he said, I don't understand. I'm really confused. What does salt and chickens and cranes have anything to do with anything? And Parasara said, let me expand upon the incredible wisdom of Ananta. An enlightened person or a person seeking enlightenment must be like salt. What's the quality of salt? If you put too much salt in a preparation, it becomes unpalatable. If you put too little salt in a preparation, it may not have much flavor at all. 
to make a preparation really satisfying, there has to be a proper balance of salt. And similarly, a person truly seeking truth must be balanced. In Bhagavad Gita, he said, Krishna tells that those who are in the path of true dharma, true spirituality, they do not eat too much or eat too little. They do not sleep too much or too little. They are balanced in their work, their recreation, their relationships with the necessary interactions with their family and friends, and with their spiritual practices. This balance is the secret of success. If any of these things are out of balance, it's going to create a serious obstacle. We should be balanced in our spiritual practices and in all of our worldly, apparently worldly relationships and obligations. Similarly, we should be balanced in how we react to challenges that are in our life. It's the tendency, and we see it a lot these days, to go to extremes. It's the easy thing to do, to react to something in a very extreme way. And then somebody else is going to react to that in another extreme way. And so much polarization and so much disunity. But a balanced approach, a thoughtful approach, is very important to resolve the issues that are in our lives individually and collectively. Another quality of salt is Let me think about this for a moment. Salt completely gives up its separateness to merge into a preparation, to permeate it with its flavor. And in a similar way, a person who is truly spiritually oriented relinquishes their false egos, which separates them from God, which separates them from their true relationship on a spiritual level with others. When we relinquish that false ego, that ahankar that separates us, then we can actually not only theoretically understand, but we can experience the true unity of all life. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives a beautiful verse in the sixth chapter. Vidyavanaya sampane brahmani gabhyastini suni chaiva svapake cha pandita samadarshana. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the natural ability to see the true equality in all beings. And the Gita explains whether one is a human with all its variations, we may be black or white or red or yellow or brown, we may be male or female, from the east to the west, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. We may be Christians or Jews or Muslims or Hindus or Jains or Sikhs or Parsis or Buddhists or agnostics, agnostics or atheists. The Gita tells we may be humans or cows, or dogs, or cats, or elephants. 
Real wisdom is when we understand who we really are as loving parts of God, then we could recognize aham bija pratapita. We're all children of the same source, the same mother and the same father. Self-realization is not about some sectarian concepts. It's about realizing the true equality of all beings and to live with respect and compassion in whatever we do. What separates us from that? This ahankar, this ego. So like salt, when we give up this ego, then we can actually enter into a truly deep, loving relationship with God and others. What is the qualities of a chicken? I'm going to really abbreviate this. How many of you have ever been praised by being compared to a chicken? Please raise your hands. Usually, you know, you, he has the strength of a lion. He has the, the regalness of an elephant. He, she, you know, she has the eyes of a deer, and she, or you know, so many things like that, that the, the song of a sweet nightingale. But usually if someone compares you to a chicken, it's, <laughs> it's an insult. But hopefully after hearing what Parasara said, you'll never think it an insult again. Great people are like a chicken. One of the qualities of a chicken, and I've seen it with my own eyes, if a chicken comes to a rubbish bin, it won't even look at the rubbish. It'll just look for a single nourishing seed and eat that seed. And just look, look only for the seed. Saragrahi, this is Sanskrit. It means those who are aspiring for perfection have to look for the essence. Seek the essence. Anyone could find faults with other people. Somehow or other, because of the ego, we think it makes us look really great when we could find faults with others. The more I can find faults with other people and condemn them and criticize them, the more I feel powerful and great and important. That's a very sick state spiritually. To look for the good in others. For the look, to look for the potential of good in others is a life of dharma or truth. Charu and his guru, my guru, Srila Prabhupada, we, we were so inspired. 51 years ago, he left the holy land of Vrindavan and came to America on a cargo ship. 38 days, he had heart attacks and seasickness. When he arrived in New York City, he had, no, he had $7. He didn't know anyone. He was really struggling for about a year. He was in poverty, but he was so wealthy. He wasn't asking people for money. He was only asking people to accept what he came to bring. When he came to America, one journalist asked him, why have you come to our country? He said, I have not come to convert people. I've come to enlighten people. I've just come to remind you of what you forgot, that you're divine, your soul is beyond birth and death. Your soul is such an ananda, it's full of happiness and knowledge. Your soul is full of love, but you're just so distracted. I've come to remind you of that. Because he saw the potential within us, 
we could recognize the potential within us. That's the quality of a spiritual teacher. They see that potential within us that we've lost contact with and give us faith and hope of who we really could be. Beyond all the depression and, and, and arrogance and, and, and sadness of this world, there's something supremely beautiful about us. And when we recognize that, like a lotus flower, even if it's in a muddy place, it spreads its beauty and fragrance all around. So a chicken is always looking for that essence in others because it's seeking the essence within ourselves. And also a chicken is seeking in every situation an opportunity to grow. There's so many things we could complain about. There are limitless reasons to complain and they're all justified. But if we look for positive opportunities to grow in every situation, we will find them in abundance. That's what we could learn from a chicken. And in our own spiritual process, when we really are seeking the essence, we don't get distracted by sectarianism or all superficial differences. We really look to the heart and we recognize it in our own tradition and in the traditions of others as well. What are the qualities we could learn from a crane? A crane is a bird, a white bird with long legs and long pointed beak. And when a crane stands in a stream of water on one leg, he or she is looking down in the water very carefully. And so many little fish are passing by. 10 fish, 100 fish, 1,000 fish. And the crane just watches. And as soon as a big fish comes, <coughs> the crane feasts. Now, personally, I don't eat fish. But still, it's a good story, because cranes do. <laughs> <laughs> the story tells us that in the stream of life, there's so many little things that come by us. And we can get so distracted by them, so disturbed by them, so much eager and, 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 and longing for them. We could spend our whole life just trying to get little fish. But from the crane, we understand that all these superficial little situations that are happening that can make us so angry, that can make us so full of lust, arrogance, they really don't have much importance at all. What do people fight about? What do people cheat each other about? Greed, envy, anger, arrogance, selfish passion. It's all looking for little fish. But if we understand what's really important in life, sam toshinam, how are we connecting with our true self? How are we pleasing God through our efforts, through our relationships in our family, through our relationships with society, through our occupation, through our spiritual practice? How are we pleasing God? How are we spiritually growing? There's a saying, you can tell how rich you are by counting how many things you have that money cannot buy. Money can never buy peace, it can never buy happiness, it can never buy love. But it could, 
if we find that peace and happiness and love within us, then money and intelligence and abilities can be extremely valuable in sharing it. But if we don't find that thing to share, then it's all superficial. It's all little fish. If we keep our mind focused on what's really important in life, what's really a value of life, param drishtvani vartate, then all the distractions, we deal with them, but we let them pass. We don't become obsessed with them. What is the difference between material and spiritual in Bhagavad Gita? Spiritual is the recognition that I'm an eternal child of the Supreme Beloved. And in whatever I do, Sanatana Dharma is to express that love. And when we have that vision, we see that the entire creation is coming from that same source. One time our Guru Prabhupada was asked, how do we see God everywhere? And he gave a very, very practical little answer. He, he pointed toward his eyeglasses. And so when you look at these eyeglasses, what do you think? He said, I think this is Prabhupada, my Guru's eyeglasses. And Prabhupada said, oh, and what do you feel when you think that? I feel, because I remember you, I feel my love for you. He said, everything is the property of God. When we recognize God within ourselves, then we see that everything in this world is sacred property to be used for a sacred purpose then we see everything in this world in its spiritual essence. From the Gita's perspective, material means whatever we may see, this microphone or this building, when we forget its relationship with the divine, when we forget our relationship with the divine, that vision is material. Inherently, Everything is spiritual, and everyone is our brothers and sisters. This we could learn from the crane and not let ourselves be distracted by all the stupid stuff going on around us. That's the way Swami speaks sometimes. <laughs> and as far as you, Parasara said, a saintly person is like you because you were so eager to know the truth that you were willing to wait six months <laughs> and you were willing to serve all those people. In other words, you'd, you appreciated the value of truth. We all have the opportunity to truly be happy in whatever situation we're in. In this book, The Journey Within, I, read, I write about some of the people I've known over the years who've really been in the most challenging situations. A husband and a wife who had a child born that would never be able to speak or walk or feel anything but physical pain throughout their life. Can you imagine the heartbreak of being such a mother? But how they processed it with wisdom to give their hearts and their lives in compassion for this child and understand the gift 
of how they could grow and help that child grow, even in that situation. Real happiness is not based on circumstances. Real happiness is our inherent nature. The purpose of all religions, spiritual paths, and yoga is to reconnect us with that happiness. And that is what we call the journey within. Thank you very much. such beautiful people. If only you could see yourself from where I'm seeing you. <laughs> you would be happy forever. <laughs> Thank you so very much. It's just, I'm so grateful. Okay, so I have a question. What is that beginning, burning uh, thing which started you to be on that spiritual path? Because when you travel India, you were 17 years old. That was not the starting point that I'm going to India to get the spiritual. You went to Europe and all that. What was that? I only have a couple minutes for questions. <laughs> And the answer to that question is a book I wrote called The Journey Home. <laughs> but in, in essence, some people consider that the 1960s were a time of revolution and question, which they were. There was the civil rights movement I got involved in, and there was the counterculture, which I got involved in, and there was a Vietnam War that was, didn't really make that much sense to us, that we were told either you go there and fight or go to jail. It didn't make so much sense. So these were not just questions that were theoretical. These were questions that really were right in our face and going to affect our lives. When I was a boy, my father, he really struggled economically and he invested all the money he had with his brother and went in total bankruptcy. He lost everything and was struggling so as soon as I could, I got a job to help. And the job I had was with African-American people. I was in a car wash. <laughs> and they were, they were all my father's age. And I, we loved each other. But they were so beaten down by discrimination, prejudice, poverty, they were all alcoholics, just, you know, as, as a way to deal with the, almost the impossible crises of their life. 
And in those days when I'd stand before the flag every day in school, because that was, we put our hand on our heart and we pledged allegiance to the flag. And I still remember that. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And I remember while I was saying that, I really wanted that. But it seems that it's not for all. If you have a different color or a different religion, then it doesn't seem to apply to you. And I was confused. Because I really wanted to believe in the American dream. And I believe the country was built on a foundation of these principles, but it didn't make sense to my young mind. So I was looking for answers. And I became kind of revolutionary. But then I kind of looked around me and thought, you know, myself and all the revolutionary people, we have the same problems as everybody else. We just have a different cause. <laughs> and I came to a conclusion that it has, there has to be a change of heart. And that change of heart was spiritual. But then there's another problem I faced. Because in the name of religion, I saw, I was from a minority religion, the Jewish faith. And in those days, a lot of people hated me. I, didn't, I wasn't even sure what I believed in, but they hated me just because I'm from a family. Why is there hatred in the name of a loving God? Either I have to reject religion, or there must be that essence within all the great spiritual paths that bring about something beautiful in life. And to the core of my heart, I believed that was there. And I was looking for that. I was reading books. I was learning prayers. I was learning meditation. And ultimately, my friend Gary, he called me once and he, and he told me, I'm going to Europe and you have to come with me. I said, I don't have any money. He said, I don't either. <laughs> He said, but our f common friend, Frank, he has money and he wants us to go with him, so he's gonna pay. <laughs> so I, I was convinced. So we took a $65 flight from New York to Iceland with a connecting flight to Luxembourg. And the first day we got to Luxembourg, we got um, our first taste of Frank's sponsorship capacity. <laughs> the three of us slept in a one-man tent in a campground. And the next morning, Frank got robbed. <laughs> and he had a return ticket and told us to go with him. And he, left, he, came, he went back to America, and Gary and I had nothing but we were enthusiastic to see the world. So we started hitchhiking. And as I was hitchhiking, seeing new cultures and people I've, of so many different varieties, different landscapes and historical sites and museums, I started gravitating toward cathedrals and synagogues and monasteries, and then I was going out into the forests, and ultimately I was living in caves. And I got this calling. What, became, what was a spark for spiritual aspiration became like a blazing fire by my, my experiences in life. And one day in the island of Crete, part of Greece, while crying for direction on top of a mountain, I heard a voice go to India. And I told Gary back at the cave we were living, I'm going to India in the morning. And he didn't want to go. <laughs> so going through the Middle East, I studied Judaism, Christianity in Europe. I studied Islam when I got to India. I studied various forms of Buddhism and Hinduism and yoga. And 
ultimately God sent me to Vrindavan where I found this path of bhakti. But to conclude my little answer to your beautiful question, whether it's 2,000 years ago, whether it's during the Great Depression, whether it's during the 1960s, or whether it's 2016, the election year of America, <laughs> essentially the same problems are there and the same causes of the problems. People, when we have selfishness, when we have arrogance, when we have greed and envy and, and anger, it brings the worst out in people and it comes in so many different forms. People have always sought a deeper purpose in life, a deeper meaning in life. The Gita tells, Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyuta nama dharmasya tadatmanam sarjamya. This is the words of Krishna. He says, throughout history, the one supreme God has descended into this world with many names in many places, speaking many languages, ultimately to remind us of what we've all forgotten. Yajketva na punaramoham evam yashashi pandava. Yena Gita tells, when you know the truth, you understand that we're all loving parts of the same Supreme Beloved. And we see everyone in that spirit. And it's that experience of love everyone's looking for. I hope that kind of answers your question. Thank you. Thank you um, for the nice talk. Uh, and um, this will be last question. Oh, I'm lucky. Um, maybe it's a simplistic question, but I noticed when you were speaking, even though we were hearing you speak about your book, you almost never spoke about yourself. It's very interesting. How can we be more like you and possess these qualities you have? It's not an easy question, I guess, but... Please don't try to be like me. <laughs> <laughs> but we could all aspire for some of the things that I aspire for. Thank you for your kind words. I have a question. Can I please? Uh, can I? Can I ask you a question, please? I don't think we have much choice right now. <laughs> please, please, sir, whatever your uh, question. <laughs> you, have, you have two books. It's all about journey within, mm -hmm. journey... Journey within, journey home. Journey home came first. A journey within came second. Why is that? That's number one. Number two, you have a choice between India, Israel, Italy. Why do you choose India? Two questions. Yes, I understand. Thank you. I explained my promise to Bhakti Tirta Swami that I would write the journey home. After I wrote it, I was thinking, it's done. <laughs> Finished. But then some inconceivable things happened where people really wanted to know what I, what I really discovered 
and how I try to apply it in my life for the years after. And the journey within is about the teachings of bhakti. Journey home is my search for truth. And the culmination is I, I found the truth in my life in living a life according to the teachings of bhakti. So what is that I discovered? And how those teachings are really the essence of all true spiritual paths. What is bhakti? In the Srimad Bhagavat, it describes Savai Pung Sampuro Dharamo Yato Bhakti Radhokshaji. Ahoitaki Aprati Hata Yayatma Supraseetati. Dharma sometimes means religion, sometimes occupation, sometimes our inherent nature. The Bhagavatam says the supreme dharma is not a sectarian concept. The supreme dharma is that which awakens the love within our heart. The love for God and the subsequent natural love for each other. Such love, in order to truly satisfy us, must be unmotivated by egoism or selfishness and uninterrupted by inevitably changing circumstances. And I found the words of Moses and Jesus, the first commandment, to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And if you do, what is the natural expression? That you love, every, you love your neighbor as yourself. And everyone is our neighbor. Whatever their race, nationality, religion, whatever their species. The environment is our neighbor. When we understand ourself, when we understand the grace of God, we naturally love our neighbor as ourself. Bhakti is tuning in to grace. You see, and I'm going to end with one little analogy. Satellite TVs, some of you may watch them. It's quite incredible. Because <clears throat> when I grew up in the 1950s in Chicago, we were really proud of being such a modern city. We had four television stations. ABC, NBC, CBS, WGN and WTTW, which was an educational channel. But I'll never forget, I used to wake up early because the best show for me was at six o'clock in the morning. One television station, they started their day every day with a song by Mahalia Jackson, who was a gospel singer, just crying out for God. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, today, and in those days, you had to walk across the room and turn a dial to change the channels. Can you imagine doing that? And every time you change the channels, you had to change the configuration of the antenna on top of, you had to twist it and turn it and put it next to the window to try to get a reception. Then you lay in your bed again, and if you didn't like the show, you had to do it all over again. You had to get up and... <laughs> now I go to my father's house, and he has a television practically as big as his wall. He's 92 years old. And he has this little remote, and he goes... There's like 200 stations. And... And I was analyzing it. <laughs> you know, how is it you just press a button and there's news from Baghdad, live. And then, and there's, there's a football game from Texas. 
Texas. And, then, and there's some romantic, you know, couple in a soap opera. And, and there's, every station's different. How does it happen so fast? It's not that you call the television station and, and order, you know, I want to see the show. Just, that means the frequencies of all these stations are right there, everywhere. And according to what you tune into, that's what you're going to access. Does that make sense? I'm not a scientist, but this is my understanding. And similarly, the f we're all like antennas. Everything we speak, everything we do, everything we feel is emitting a certain energy. And it's affecting the world. Greed. There is a collective frequency or energy of greed where we're all contributing to it. And when we become greedy, we're tuning into that frequency. And it's not just about us, it's about how we agree to be influenced by the world of greed. When we tune in on our own choice to envy, we're tuning into the whole com universal compilation of people's envy. And we get influenced by it. There's also goodness. There's also kindness. That's an energy everywhere too. And who we associate with and the choices we make and what we decide to, as our forms of entertainment helps us to tune into that. But there's also an all-pervading energy of grace. What is grace? It's the supreme, ultimate beloved of every heart extending Grace is the feminine aspect of the one supreme, the motherly, compassionate, nourishing aspect of God that's everywhere and within everything. And when we chant this kirtan, when we offer prayer, when we sincerely and humbly perform our spiritual practice, we're tuning into the frequency of grace. And we become purified. We become happy. And then we become antennas of that grace through our thoughts, our words, and our actions. That's bhakti. That's at the heart of spirituality. And journey within is a simple attempt to appreciate the people that God has gifted me to know who really inspire that, that gift in all of us. I hope that answers your two questions. Why India? Because I can't give you a philosophical explanation. It's just the way God directed me. You know, we, each and every one of us have our own calling. And do you know something? You don't have to go to India. Not everyone has to be stupid like me. I risked my life, I went through deserts, I got all kinds of diseases, I, so many problems, just to find what you could find right here in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's within your own heart. Yeah.